When you worked in Uzbekistan back in 2000s, could you imagine that Uzbekistan uh, could transform itself without outside interference or pressure, without street protests, without uh, any color or violent revolutions? Yes. There is in Uzbekistan, I, I, I felt it, I saw it, I worked with it, a um, cohesive political elite. And you know the, the myth in the West was that you had a supreme leader who was all or nearly all powerful. When in fact, um, the politics of Uzbekistan was reaching a kind of consensus or at least a kind of agreement within that elite. So if the elite understands that the challenges of the country require uh, a new course, then the country will head in that course. And that's why, I'm not going to say I predicted we were going to see this, this opening that we've witnessed now for almost two years. But I was confident that there was going to be a peaceful transfer of power before the transfer. And knowing how Uzbek uh, society works, I can't say this, this departure surprises me. Certainly outside pressure was not going to do it. In Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan used to be a model of democracy. Uh, can Uzbekistan now become a model for peaceful transition of power? Well, I, I think we've already seen that. We've, we've seen a peaceful transition of power. It is true that um, you'd have to say that in, Uzbek excuse me, in Central Asia, the only quasi-democratic country is Kyrgyzstan. But the tradition, the changes of power in Kyrgyzstan have been unruly. Not awful, but, but unruly. In Uzbekistan, it was rather clear and it was um, without pain. And the results in terms of the policies we're seeing are positive. But what do you make of the situation in which a uh, number two man in the government, in the country, uh, reverses most of the policies of the previous leader whom he was loyal to for 15 plus years and most of the policies that he aggressively pursued and promoted and implemented while he was a prime minister for 13 years? Well, I would not overestimate the changes in policy. We, we can't talk about Uzbekistan today, for example, as a truly uh, open society or as a democracy. What we're seeing is a certain opening, a certain easing of some hardline policies, especially in the area of human rights and in the prisons system. Uh, and of course, we're seeing uh, important changes in at least foreign policy within Central Asia. But of course, those sorts of cha foreign policy changes are easy to do. Uh, but my understanding, now I've only been to Uzbekistan once since I left as ambassador in 2003, but I was there last November. I had a chance to chat with a good many people. And the impression I came away with was that the it was not just President Mirziyoyev who understood the need for the openings that are now associated with his name. Others in, in you know, the top of Uzbek society also understood this. And um, so that means these ideas were, were fermenting while President Karimov was still in power. Have you met Mr. Mirziyoyev? I remember meeting him a long time ago. I've not met President Mirziyoyev. So you didn't meet him last year? No, no, no. I think I met him when he was governor in Samarkand during my time in Tashkent. Some people still don't believe that uh, Mirziyoyev is committed to reform. What are the signs, what are the indications of real reform, real commitment? Well, we've already seen um, some important changes, uh, but relatively small domestically. You know, there's, there's talk about, again, about having a freely convertible sum. Uh, it, it's clear that, that life is getting a little bit easier. We, we, we've seen an easing of the pressure that the police were putting on folks who are, who are not considered to be part of uh, political, legitimate political society in Uzbekistan. Uh, we've seen relatively modest changes, but real. I think we, we need to see no pullback from the changes that are in place and some steps forward. I mean. For example, if, if the SUM is truly made freely convertible, that will be a major, major, and from my standpoint, positive change. Um, but one that 
cannot necessarily be expected overnight because there are vested interests that would find that problematic. Mr. Ambassador, are you satisfied with the current U.S. policy towards Central Asia and in particular to Uzbekistan? And what is the policy, by the way? Um, by and large, I think American policy has been consistent for 25 years. Uh, one, we support strongly the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of all the Central Asian states. We think that's important for stability in the region. And if there's instability in Central Asia, there could be very serious consequences because it's, it's bordered by major powers, China, Russia, India, and some active middle powers like Pakistan and Iran. And then, of course, we also believe the countries are better off and that our interests are served if countries move towards an open society, both in terms of political life and economic life. So I think that is our policy. I think that's been consistent throughout. There are uh, specifics relating to each historical period. So, of course, when I was there with the war in Afghanistan, it was very important to have, for us to have a much closer security relationship with Uzbekistan and also with some of the other countries in the region, and we developed that. Uh, that's, again, in balance, on balance our policy. Uh, I think that's the right policy. I believe that there are times, however, and this may be one of those times, when we don't pay enough attention to Central Asia. Having said that, uh, I'll now at least partly qualify it. I think we're paying good attention to Uzbekistan. And that's why it looks like we're going to see President Mirziyoyev here in Washington later this month. I know that the administration is very pleased with our cooperation with Uzbekistan on Afghanistan. I know that the Central Asia watchers in our government um, appreciate the changes that are taking place in Tashkent. They recognize that there's now uh, a true chance for regional cooperation in Central Asia, which was not easy to do under President Karimov. And this cooperation is very good for the stability and prosperity of Central Asia. Uh, maybe now there can be some progress on water issues, which have been very, very difficult for the last 25 years. And I believe that President Mirziyoyev is going to be seeing President Trump because Washington understands that this is a dynamic and important new leader, and they want to have a closer relationship with him. And of course, I welcome that. How can the United States help uh, Mirziyoyev in these endeavors? First, greater engagement. Let, let, let not just Uzbekistan, but Kazakhstan, and the other countries in Central Asia see that the United States is going to be active there. Uh, I believe uh, we should encourage reform in Uzbekistan, but not uh, with too heavy a hand, recognizing that, again, as I said earlier, Uzbek leadership will make up its own mind. I think we should be open and encourage greater trade and greater investment, as long as, with the changes in Uzbekistan, that investment can be successful. Uh, it cannot be arbitrarily uh, let's say, uh, inve foreign investment cannot be arbitrarily expropriated or um, change hands because of corrupt courts. So there needs to be certain types of guarantees on the Uzbek side, which would be good for Uzbekistan, not just for Western firms or American firms wanting to invest there. And I think we should make it clear that we do have major, major interests in the region, including in Uzbekistan, and I believe we do. You know that Russia has a large influence on Uzbekistan. Uh, people speak Russian, people watch Russian television, people uh, follow Russian language websites. So the nar Russian government, Russian media narrative is that the United States has lost its credibility to preach or promote democracy um, after uh, the uh, wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, now Syria, and other events. And that uh, democracy came to mean chaos, uh, economic collapse, regime change which Uzbeks don't accept. Uh, what do you think the United States can do to regain uh, or re reverse that view for Uzbeks? This, this is a very serious problem. Uh, the Kremlin has near total control over the Russian media. 
and they use that to spread propaganda and even lies, along with some very sophisticated television programming. Uh, I would like us to be more active uh, in the information space in Central Asia, and for that matter, around the world. I think the United States should be much more active, and our allies in Europe should be much more active, and allies elsewhere, in combating Kremlin propaganda. And in fact, we at the Atlantic Council, my center, the Eurasia Center, is doing a lot of work in this area. In fact, we'd love to do an event in, in Tashkent, or maybe Samarkand, on precisely the subject. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that we can do. Uh, but ultimately, the Russians have an advantage because their media is just present in Central Asia, and they're willing to spend the money, which at this point we're not quite willing to spend, although I'd like to change that. Who do you think Uzbeks trust more, the United States or Russia? I, I left Uzbekistan full-time, um, my goodness, 15 years ago. I was there for about six days last month. I don't think I have enough information to answer your question uh, with confidence. But given the, given the ubiquity of the Russian media in Uzbekistan, I suspect, on balance, the average Uzbek might have a little bit more trust towards Russia than towards the United States. Uh, but that's simply because they are bombarded with all this bad information, and they don't have um, serious information of a, of a more reliable kind. But there, there's one, one point I think it's important to make. Uh, there's no question the United States makes mistakes. Our interventions, uh, I would say our intervention in Afghanistan was necessary, but we, had, we were not skillful in that intervention. Our inter intervention in Iraq was unnecessary, even though I supported it at the time, and it was a great mistake. Um, but the United States is not um, unable, in other words, the United States is able to admit its errors. And we don't say to people in Uzbekistan or people anywhere, around the, anywhere in the world, um, follow us because we are um, infallible. We don't even say follow us. We, we say work with us. Because we believe that our style of government, our style of economic life, will create a better life for you. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, the Russian media, when it talks about American failures, does not talk about the standard of living in Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania. These countries have no oil, but they have a far higher per capita income than Russia, whose per capita income is only as high as it is because of oil and gas, right? The Russians don't talk about the standard of living in Poland or Bulgaria. These countries, which were every bit as poor as Uzbekistan, 30 years ago, are now wealthy countries. So what can Uzbekistan do to become like the countries in the Baltic? I don't have any doubt that Uzbekistan can make extraordinary progress in that direction. Uh, I hesitate to say to be as prosperous as the Baltic states for the very simple reason that the Baltic states are not double landlocked. And, and that, is, that is a problem. But not an insuperable problem. I have no doubt, based upon my experience in Uzbekistan and what I know about the country, that given the talent of the people, the historic achievement of the people, that if the government pursues its current reforms consistently, broadly, and deeply, in other words, the reforms right now are relatively modest. They'd have to become much, much deeper. If they do that and the country opens up, I don't have any doubt that you, you'll find yourselves on the way to being a prosperous country. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, but these things will require some short-term adjustments. That cohesive Uzbek elite that I talked about would have to recognize that some of the advantages they have need to be changed. Uh, and over time, I, I am confident that will happen. I just wish it would happen in the next five or six years not the next 20. But we're, we are on the path now that possibly it could happen in five or six years, although I would hesitate to make that prediction.